And uh, he he'd stay there. He lived on Slady Fork, but he he would stay there like during, at night. And mm -hmm. uh, so he would sit out on that porch in the evening. And I I got to going. I had a bicycle riding around town. This was this was would have been all oh, from about 1960. Okay, six, uh, 59, 60. I got. Right. And we we'd sit there, and he would you know tell me about. Uh, the old engines and have the logging and where they was and what went on and everything just story story after story you know and uh, so then when the job shut down in July of 1960 it wasn't hardly any time and I don't know what the time involved there but it wasn't just seemed me like before the end of the summer they was they were starting to jump things out and they uh, they went had the steel was still laid in cabin fork had 25 miles of steel so they was pulling them rails all up and everything and they stayed up the wide where them camp cars was they didn't come on in they would just you know stay up there and uh, they worked at that and then uh, after they uh, Got down up there, pulling the steel and everything down the mountain. They come down, then they uh, pulled the track up from Spruce up to the top of the hill, and uh, then the state got was involved in it. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, uh, but what they done? They loaded uh, that steel out downtown. You know, like cutting skitters all up. They brought them in where that mining engines is next to the hill there. <laughs> That's that's where they had the skitters setting and stuff like that. There, right. was, there was a couple, two, three cabooses there that uh, that they'd used back when earlier days. I don't think that the logging company ever did haul them. But, okay. Uh, I mean, Meyer that much. He may haul them at the beginning operations some, but anyhow. Uh, uh, and then the, the cars. I think they had about. 30 or 40 flat cars and uh, then they had camp cars and I'm not sure what the number of them but they had them where they set the cars up that track they put a, a block up in the woods on a tree at, with a cable on and they just hooked on to them flipped them over and set them on fire and burnt, burnt them all up right there got rid of the wood yeah and it got rid of all the wood and then the junk in they would cut it down to all three or four foot lengths, and then they loaded it in a gondola. Well, they had uh, one of the engines fired up up there to uh, just switch the cars around, you know. But it, he just run the engine for it too. So I got, I'd go up there with him to the day, and, and uh, you know, just fool around, set the engine with him, and talk and different things. And uh, did you have anybody firing for him at that point when they were scrapping, or was no, it enough? No, he just it wasn't that much moving around. Yeah. You know, he just made me move the car down, put it up to 
-hmm. C and O for the C and O to pick up and then bring another empty in. They's loading it in gondolas. Is what so all that scrap was going out by C and O. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Midwest, Midwest Raleigh. Yeah, I believe it was. And some you can see earlier pictures of the engines it has Midwest Raleigh on the side of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, they done that. That they and then they would. Uh, I, I see that side track. I seen it sitting just full of wheels from way up there, putting near down to the shop door. What they do, they for a while they would press them wheels off the axle because the wheel part was cast iron, the axle was steel. See, mm -hmm. they were separating her and they loading all that out. And uh, so uh, it. Uh, <clears throat> It was kind of a sad, sad place around there, mm -hmm. and uh, of course he, at that time, they didn't, you know, he, he said, well, the engines would be the last thing that was, would be cut up, and uh, the state just got in just just at the nick of time before they, that had been the next thing that they was going to work on, and, uh, but anyhow, they got, uh, uh, I think it was about, I just forget the number. It was about eight or ten of them flat cars he saved, and um, then he saved. I think it was four camp cars, and uh, they. Uh, of course, that's what they used on the tourist rail in the beginning. Is them wooden cars? They used them up clear up to oh, probably it's 1970, and uh, then. Uh, but they just went to Whittaker up to 67, and 68 they, they opened the, the mountain on the bottom of Okay. And, uh, but, uh, but what I done then, when I went to work in 1965, my first job was hustling the engines. Of course, I only had one to hustle at that time, because that's all they had would, would run at that time. What they, engine ran at that point? Well, I'll take that back. They, they brought number five out then in 1965, and when they started out in '63, they had a fixed number four. They had to put some side sheets in it, and then they they run it in '63, then '64. They just had number four, but back in 1963, number four broke an axle up. Uh, I think the first one broke was going up into Whittaker up there and of course they nipped it back down to cast but most axles will snap off on the inside of the wheel if they normally break but they snapped off out on the journal what had happened the journals had got wore on the engine and they built them up with weld and turned them back down you can't do that because right where your bead quits a crack will start well then that thing got down would be about that much holding it you know and that just snap off <clears throat> so uh, they had to far number one up and they run it in a short period of time there 1963 to haul the tourist and uh, uh, I got to far it but anyhow that they was uh, uh, talking about working on it and then they planned to work on it, but then they wanted to fix number five up because it was a little bigger engine, and then mm -hmm. it was one of the original engines. And uh, of course, the rest of them was original too, for the log job was concerned. But it come there brand new, and it was kind of a favorite all down through the years. And uh, so they uh, <coughs> took put it in the shop. He's putting a hydro on it and had it up to pressure, and you had to go in the far box and take a hammer. And Hit the stay bolts, and Jess McCoppin, he was uh, he was in there doing that. And he was uh, he was a shop foreman and blacksmith. Okay. Uh, and, uh, over there, even back in logging days, he was a blacksmith, made bolts and whatever they had to form out, you know. And uh, so uh, anyhow, he's in there wrapping them their stay bolts, had it up to about 300 pounds to bore, and just now that. That thing ripped 15 inches, the side sheet, right down. Said that water shot out of there just like a knife. <laughs> it said like the ground at him before he got out the far box. 
And uh, so what, then, what, which engine was that? Number five. Five. Okay. Yeah, they was go. They wanted to hydro it to see mm -hmm. if they could use it, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, it didn't stand up, so they uh, decided to put side sheets in it. And what they done? They had to uh, cut the frame in two on both sides of the far box, and they just left the. They didn't. They didn't pick the boiler up out of the frame, which had been a lot easier if they don't. But that's the way they choose to do it. And they put side sheets <coughs> up to the. Well, it was up pretty high, about probably at least four foot high in the far box on each side, and a uh, piece under the far door. So they worked on that there, and they brought number five out in 1965, and uh, they run it on the rail fan run with number four and number five. And, uh, but then, it was just like, uh, I don't know what some of these rail, I'm re I remember the Roanoke chapter would come up, but it was just a couple times, you know, the, the year they would have these uh, rail fans and come in. They didn't, that was before they started the, the organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyhow, they run it and uh, that year and then, uh, in 1966 season, they run it, and uh, the as well as I remember, it got to, it got a leak behind the dry pipe where it's mounted the, the or steam bracket where the cylinders are mounted to the bore, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they couldn't get it stopped. So they uh, anyhow, what I get ahead of my story. When they took the side sheets out of it. The outside sheets was bad too, oh, so yeah. then they just cut the outside sheets out too, and they renewed that all up, you know, on, on each side. On each side. Yeah, and um, of course I was in high school at that time, and, and every every time I got off for some reason or other, and the shop was working, I always went up to the shop and uh, fo uh, fooled around with them in the shop and stuff sure. like that. There, that was an old shop, and. Uh, and so they uh, they got that thing done, but anyhow they got it out. Of, and uh, so, like I say, they run it there a couple of years, and then got a leak in behind the cylinders. Well, they put a stay bolt in. And they thought it was a stay bolt. Well, it didn't didn't help the problem. And so they decided to take the cylinder, cylinders off of it. And uh, but I, I I'm still ahead of my story. Anyhow, they had to. Uh, and number five, they took it over back to the mill and used it to put the mill run for to run the dry kill. Yeah. What time is now? Yeah. Well, they what they done? The, the steam was coming out the drains underneath the cylinders, and the superintendent come up and told him wasn't that much steam, you know, like when sitting over there, you see a little steam coming out. He said, shut that off, but they're losing too much steam, so they shut that off. Of course, that the cylinders and everything, dry pipe condensed clear full of water. Well, it was in the winter time, so they probably took the fire out of the engine sitting over there. Well, then all that froze up and busted the cylinders in the dry pipe. So uh, they had to uh, had that that problem. Well, they tried to fix some of them over there, raise them up, but they cracked so bad and they had no luck with it so mm -hmm. they decided to have uh, cylinders made for it so they took them over to Elkins to Kelly Foundry and uh, they uh, they made the patterns and stuff over there for them and then they took it on down to uh, <clears throat> Clarksburg uh, Quality Foundry down at Clarksburg cast the dry pipe and the cylinders and they had them all machined and everything. So, but the surface on the, the dry pipe, they didn't do a real smooth machining surface. So you had to lap that all in. You had a lapping block, which was about that bigger square. It was about an inch thick cast iron. So what, you had to get lapping compound and sit there and just rub that thing. Mm -hmm. And they they rubbed on that thing one whole summer over there. And. Uh, they got her all dressed down and the cylinders lapped in and I put, put it all together and and uh, she worked pretty good and then 
1967, they had to uh, had that leak, so we, we took the cylinders off, and here around them stay bolts, there's little star cracks that started out around. Them. So they uh, they cut they cut the stay bolts out of it, and they's building them building up around the stay bolts, you know, and was go to redrill them and mm -hmm. put the stay bolts back in. Well, an FLRA guy come, got up on there and said, no, I said, that's illegal, you can't do that. You have to cut that cut that uh, section of sheet all out, replace that. Well, okay, so they cut the stay bolts back out again, cut the rivets out to take that section all off, and they, <clears throat> when they, Pulled that off, and then he looked in on the crown sheet, and here the crown sheet around the stay bolts was deteriorated. Mm. So they so they went over on the le left hand side, the farming side too, and took about the same section out that they did on the engineer side, and then we cut cut the crown sheet out of it. And uh, we, uh, me and uh, Paul Bradley, he was a welder, mm -hmm. he was there at that time, and. Uh, he, they formed, they took a sheet somewhere, probably down to Charleston, usually at Canal Manufacturing or mm -hmm. somewhere, and they formed a sheet. So then they just brought it back, then we had to drill all the holes. You come over on the side of your boiler, your holes is going through at a right angle, so we had to, he figured out a, a jig where you had to, and then he welded the thing up, and where it would guide his drill, because mm -hmm. you know it'd skip off. You had to yeah. have something to hold it in place. Yeah. We, uh, I helped him drill all them holes one winter, and uh, then we put it all in there and filled it all up and everything, and uh, uh, put the stay bolts and everything back in it. Driving them stay bolts overhead by hand, but with a hammer. That's the way we drove them. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, that was a job. And. Uh, so they brought it out, and all some of them, there was some remarks around by different ones that they didn't want to be around when it was fired up. <laughs> he blew up, reckon. But, but that thing is still in there, still working today. But anyhow, uh, got that done, and then we brought her out, and Ted, uh, Ted Burnett had come. He was, uh, he was the engineer from over in Clay County, Elk River Coal and Lumber Company, mm -hmm. and uh, he he was a, a shop foreman, but that was in 1968, and uh, no, 69, and he, uh, he we brought her out, got her all going, and then we'd use it on the pusher, we'd push the ball knob with it, and it mm -hmm. usually you just push it on weekends in for the the, mm -hmm. for the crowds and stuff. Oh, sometimes they'd call up from the depot if it got overrun. they call up and we'd get the engine ready and me and him would run it. He would run the engine and I'd fire it. Fire. But, but then, but then, anyhow, then... Who, who'd uh, run the engine? Huh? Who'd run the engine again? Ted Burdett. Ted, the yeah. shop foreman would... Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, he had run the engine. He'd come here in 19... Uh, let's see... 60... I think it was 67, he come there, him and a, another engineer from over Middle Fork, Doc, Doc Carlson, okay. went to work that time, but Ted went to work before he did, and uh, we, they worked there, and then Ted, he run on uh, 1967, he always run, run the engine on Monday, and uh, I'd fire for him, and uh, the, uh, I fired, well, I fired for Clyde Galford when I went uh, after a hustle for a while, and then I went to, uh, uh, they need the brakeman on the train, then I went to braking, and then I fired extra. This was in 1965. I'd fired on Monday to get, because he runs seven days a week. That would give the farmer, he wanted off one day a week. So that gave me opportunity part of the engine then in uh, 66 I fired uh, Clyde Galford he died in October of 1966 mm -hmm. so then Long started running the engine he was a guy from over around Cass. You uh, 
Mm, do you recall the first time that you fired up the mountain? Fired the engine? Yeah. Uh, probably 1963. I really wasn't working there, but I'd just go ride, you know. And, yeah. and uh, I fired there then, we got far number one. That's when I fired number one. They In 63. 63. See, they didn't run very much there other than when they was down for an axle and the engine was down about a week. And uh, So you would have been 16, 17 years old? Uh, no, 1963, I was uh, about 14. 14? 15, wow. yeah. Okay.